Okay, the first thing we want to do this semester is to prove the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, and that uh, starts with concepts of divisibility and greatest common divisors. So let's talk about the fundamental theorem of arithmetic first. This goes way back to grade school arithmetic where we had to factor numbers. So you could take a number like 360 and break it up. And you keep breaking it up until you're down to prime factors. So 36 times 10 is one way I could start. And then 36 is 18 times 2, 9 times 2, and this is 3 times 3. And you keep going until you're down to prime factors. And so we get 360 is 2 cubed, 3 squared, times 5. Now there's lots of other ways we could have proceeded here. I could have gone 90 times 4. 9 is, 90 is 9 times 10. 4 is 2 times 2. 3 times 3. 2 times 5. And once again, I'm seeing that 360 is 2 cubed, 3 squared, times 5. I'm getting exactly the same factorization. And so that's what the fundamental theorem of arithmetic is. It's simply the statement that any positive integer can be uniquely factored into a product of primes. So we want to explore why this is true. And get out of there. Cancel, cancel. Okay, so to appreciate this, let's pretend for the time being that we only had even numbers to work with and try doing the same type of factorizations. So 360, I could say, is 36 times 10. 36 is 18 times 2. And 18 is, I'm stuck. I can't break that up if we only have even numbers. So just use evens. And so we would conclude that 360 is 2 times 10 times 18, and that's as far as I could go. Now someone else may get off to a different start. They may say it's 90 times 4. And then 4 is 2 times 2. And 90, well, you can't break it into a product of two even numbers. And so once again, I'm stuck right there. 360 is 90 times 2 times 2. And then a third person might say, well, I'm going to start with 30 times 12. That's a product of two even numbers. And then 30, well, I can't break that up as a product of evens. 6 times 2 is 12, so I can make progress here. And look what we have. 2 times 6 times 30. So I'm getting different factorizations depending on how I get started on this factorization. So we don't have uniqueness at all. So as we go through the proof of the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, you're going to want to think to yourself, what is it that allows that proof to go through Whereas if we just had even numbers to work with, it would have to fail because we do not get unique factorization if we only have even numbers. Okay, so let's go back and define what we mean by divisor and factor. So if a and b are any two integers with a not equal to zero, we say that a divides b and write a divides b like this with a vertical bar if b is a times x for some integer x. And we can also say a is a divisor or factor of b, b is divisible by a, and that b is a multiple of a. So 2 divides 6, since 2 times 3 is equal to 6, and negative 2 divides 6, since negative 2 times negative 3 is 6. And negative 3 is an integer, so all I need is this number here to be an integer. 
And if we have something that fails to be a divisor, we'll put a slash through it. So this is saying that 3 is not a divisor of 7, or that 3 doesn't divide 7. So again, the divisors of an integer can be positive or negative. So the complete, the complete list of divisors of 6 would be 1, negative 1, 2, negative 2, 3, negative 3, 6, and negative 6. Okay, what are the divisors of 0? So let's let n be any number. What can I multiply n by to get 0? Well, n times 0 equals 0. That would imply that n is a divisor of 0, because 0 is the x value right here. So every integer is a divisor of 0, except we have this stipulation in the definition that a should not equal to 0. So any non-zero integer is a divisor of 0. OK, some basic properties of divisibility. The first one is that if d is a common factor of both a and b, then it's a factor of their sum and difference. And this can be generalized to say that d is in fact a divisor of any linear combination of a and b. So this is what we call a linear combination of a and b. And you'll note that the first property is just a special case of 2. Why is that? So what would I do? If I've already proven 2, then I just let x be 1 and y be 1, and that gives me the sum a plus b. Or I let x be 1 and y be negative 1 to get a minus b. So let's just focus our proof on part 2. So a, b, d, x, and y are given integers. d is a divisor of a and d is a divisor of b. So I'll start by writing down the hypotheses. So d is a divisor of a means that d times some integer equals a well, I've already used up x and y. Those are given values here. So let's introduce a k for some integer k. So whenever we introduce a new variable, give it a formal introduction like this. And then d is a divisor of b, means d times some integer l is b some integer l. And what are we trying to prove? I want to show that d is a divisor of a times x plus b times y. So let's take that value and see what it equals. Okay. So ax plus by would be dkx plus dly, that's just substitution, and I want to factor a d out, so it's a two-step process. What is this law called? Where I just regroup my parentheses, that's the associative law, and then Pulling off the D, what's that called? That's the distributive law. Okay, so what do we have? I have AX plus BY equals D times KX plus LY, but this is an integer right here. So we get to say that D divides AX plus BY since kx plus ly 
Is it integer? QED. Okay, another basic divisibility property I call the transitive property because the transitive law for equality is the one that says this. If A equals B and B equals C, that means that A equals C. And it's a very similar type of property. If D is a divisor of A and A is a divisor of B, then D is a divisor of B. Okay, now you should pause the recording and see if you can write down a proof yourself. I'm just going to keep plowing through things here. So D divides A means that DX equals A for some integer X. A divides B means that AY equals B for some y and z. And we're trying to prove that d is a divisor of b. So I want to show b is a multiple of d. So I start with b and I ask what does it equal? Well b is a times y. a is dx. So I'm going to substitute in dx for a use the associative law and look what we have. D times some integer is B. So D is a divisor of B since X times Y is an integer. Why is X times Y an integer? Well X and Y are integers and the integers are closed under multiplication. Okay, greatest common factors, or GCDs. So for a GCD, we'll always use the round parentheses A, B like this, or I will write GCD of A and B if I want to emphasize that it's not the ordered pair, A comma B. So we have to start with two integers that are not both zero, and the GCD of A and B is the largest positive integer dividing both A and B. So it's really a self-defining concept, the greatest common divisor. And if the greatest common divisor is 1, we'll say that A and B are relatively prime. So they share no common prime factor. Now why did I leave off 0, 0 from the definition? Well, the problem is every positive integer is a factor of zero. And so you'd have no largest common factor. If one entry is zero and the other is not zero, then what's the greatest common factor? Well, every number is a factor of zero and so I just have to focus on M and ask what's the largest factor M can have? Well, it's just itself. Uh, unless M is a negative number. If M is negative, then we would have to take its absolute value because the GCD is always a positive quantity. So that's where the absolute value is coming from. And if A and B are not both zero, then the greatest common factor is defined so why is that? Well, if I let S be the set of common factors, common factors of A and B, then what can I say about this set? Okay, so the greatest common factor should be the largest element in S. And I need to know that S has a largest element. So S is a set of integers. So what condition will guarantee that a set of integers has a maximum element? This is what we call the maximum element principle. So we'll note that S is not empty. since 
1 is certainly a common factor, and S is bounded above by what? Well, I could take the absolute value of either A or B here. Right? Any common factor of A and B is at most A in absolute value. So it's a set that's bounded above and is not empty, thus by the maximum element principle. And you can read about that concept in the in appendix to the notes. S has a maximum element. And that maximum element is, is by definition, the greatest common factor of A and B. Okay, this is the first really important property of GCDs. I call it the GCD invariance property. Um, you might also call it the subtraction property for GCDs. Give it some name so whenever you have to refer to it in a problem, uh, you don't just have to quote by theorem. 2.3.09 or some such thing. So what does it say? I want to calculate the greatest common factor of A and B. And this property says I can subtract any multiple of one number from the other without changing the greatest common factor. So if I start with two big numbers A and B, what I do is I subtract a multiple of one number from the other so right here, to create a smaller number in the first entry. So that's really the key tool to the Euclidean algorithm. Okay, proof. So let's let S be the set of common factors of A and B. This is write it in words, set of common factors of A and B, and I'll let T be the set of common factors of A minus Q, B, and B. Okay, and I claim that S equals T. So these are exactly the same set of integers. And once you know this, their maximum elements have to be equal. S and T have the same maximum element. All right, if two sets are identical, the largest integer in those sets has to be equal. But what is the largest integer in S? It's the greatest common factor of A and B. And what's the largest integer in T? It's the greatest common factor of these two numbers. So that is the GCD here is the GCD here. QED, that's what we wanted to prove. So now we have to prove the claim. It's a proof within a proof. Okay, to show two sets are equal, I'm going to show S is a subset of T, and that T is a subset of S. So let D be an element of S. What does that mean? So D is a divisor of A, and D is a divisor of B. But then by the first property, of divisibility, D divides any linear combination of A and B, which would include A minus Q times B. A linear combination of A and B. And so what do we have here? I see on the one hand that D is a divisor of B, and then we've just shown that it's also a divisor of this. And when you put those two facts together, I conclude that D is an element of T. 
So every element in S is an element of T. So S is a subset of T. Next, let's do T is a subset of S. So this time I start with D to be in T. So D divides A minus QB. And D divides B. Okay, then D would have to be a divisor of any linear combination of these two things. So you have to find some combination of A minus QB and B that adds up to A. And that's not hard to do. A minus QB plus Q times B. This is 1 times A minus QB plus Q times B. That's a, that's a linear combination. That is, but what do you get when you add these two things? The QBs cancel and you get D divides A. So this time we've got D divides B by assumption. We've just proven that D divides A. That tells me D is an S. Another QED. In other words, we've finished the proof of the claim at this point, and that completes the full proof. Okay, we're going to see how central this property is for calculating GCDs in the next section. But let me just point out for now that the concept of greatest common divisor extends easily to any number of integers. So if I have k integers, a1 through ak, we can define the greatest common factor of a1 through ak. And again, it's a self-defining concept. So if I have 15, 6, and 10, for instance, you'll notice that every pair of integers shares a common factor. So 15 and 6 have a factor of 3, 6 and 10 have a factor of 2, 10 and 15 have a factor of 5, but there is no factor other than 1 that divides all three numbers. So here the greatest common factor would just equal 1. That's a little different than saying numbers are pairwise relatively prime. So these numbers are not pairwise relatively prime. And we again have a GCD invariance property where you can subtract any multiple of one number from any of the others, and it doesn't change the GCD. So in this example, I've taken the first number and I've subtracted Q times the ith number without changing the GCD. So if I took the three numbers we had above, I could subtract, say, two sixes from 15, like that, and that would reduce the first number to three. And then you can keep going. I'll subtract two threes from six, and subtract three threes from 10. And I can keep going. I can subtract three ones from three. And you keep going down until you just have a single non-zero entry. And that will be the greatest common factor.